In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. So we have a uh, saint uh, not in the universal calendar, but in a uh, regional calendar in Italy. This is Saint Veronica Giuliani, and she was born on uh, December 27th in 1660. She's a mystic, a victim soul, and a stigmatist. Uh, at, at birth, she was given the name uh, Ursula, which means little bear. And that was kind of an implication of, of her temperament that she would have throughout life. Uh, but she was born to a, a very pious parents. Uh, she had a great love for the poor, a very pious young girl. And even as early as three years old, she started uh, setting aside some portions of her food uh, to give to poor children uh, that she met uh, in, in the city. Uh, her mother died when she was only seven years old. And um, as her mother was dying, she called her, each of her five daughters to her and entrusted each of them to one of the five wounds of Christ, a very pious mother. And uh, to uh, Saint Veronica, uh, she was entrusted uh, the heart of Christ, the wound in his side. Our mother said to her, I leave you in the heart of God, where you will not only find protection, but also learn what it is to love. And this was uh, very prophetic for her, because actually um, um, Saint Veronica would, would have to do this. She would have to learn how to love. Uh, now, she did love naturally. She had that, that generosity, even that zeal, we could say, and she was able to see Christ in others, uh, especially the poor. She once met an old beggar in, in dire need, and she had nothing to give him, so she gave him uh, the shoes she was wearing. Um, I don't know how that works. Maybe she had big feet, but uh, that she gave what she had, right? That was, that was all she had, so she gave it, and it was her favorite pair of shoes. Uh, and later, years, years later, uh, St. Veronica noted that this poor man seemed more beautiful to me than any other living being I had ever seen. And uh, one day later as she was praying, Christ himself appeared to her and gave her a pair of golden shoes and said, these are the shoes you gave me when you were a child. I was that poor beggar. And so uh, a very, very um, um, striking uh, incident indeed. Uh, but this again, so she, back, she was a little child, she was giving things she had to the poor, giving her food, giving her clothing, um, and she, she came to understand the beauty of giving everything for Christ. And she would say in her diary, uh, my Lord, what a joy it would be for me to receive the blessing of dying crucified with you in holy martyrdom as so many saints. Well, a great understanding as a child of sanctity um, and, and the love of Christ. However, at the age of 16, she realized that she had become a Jansenist, a rigorist, something we might know as a rabid trad even, uh, somebody who was just so uh, angry or so irritated or, or so, um, we could say, that, that their um, sense of justice is offended that others are so lukewarm. You should love Christ more. Why aren't you loving Christ? Why aren't you doing more? Because if you did love Christ, you would do what I'm doing. You would love Christ as much as I love Christ. Right? That, that's the tendency to think that, to, to be offended at the lack of, of whatever of, of others there may be. And, and what um, you know, St. Juliana had to realize was that uh, physical temperament, just, just how we are disposed, you know, if you have that choleric temperament, uh, you're going to do more. Right? You're, you're going you're gonna to perceive more on the outside. And what we mistake for love of Christ is really just natural zeal. It's just, just an ability to do anything well, to do anything uh, with, with, with um, uh, fervor and enthusiasm, whether it's loving Christ or pursuing a worldly career or whatever. Right? When a person of a certain temperament uh, does that, that, that's what can happen. And, and, and that was her. She had a real love for Christ, but her temperament also impelled her to do that um, uh, more or, or well. And, and, and that's what we, 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 she had to learn. She, in fact, what, what really brought this home for her uh, was that she had a vision of her heart, uh, that heart that had been entrusted to the heart of Christ, right? She'd been entrusted to the wound in Christ's side, and she had a vision in her heart. What did it look like? It was made of steel. It was a hard heart. It was not the heart of Christ, and that very deeply affected her. Um, and we could say this, this would even be her, I don't know what you could say, like her second conversion, or, or they, they talk about that sometimes, is that yes, you've given your life to Christ, you're doing, you're doing what you can, but you realize everything has to change. And so that happened for, for um, uh, St. Veronica, a uh, little Ursula still at this point, um, but more on that later. So she recognized that, and she had the humility to accept it, 
it's not easy to accept those flaws about ourselves that we are not as perfect as we want to be and and how can this how can this be i've got this sanctity on the one hand i really do love christ but on the other i have these flaws i've got a heart made of steel i'm too hard on others this is just as natural love where's the balance it takes humility to see that and to accept you sanctity and flaws can go together and god just wants you to work at it so um so she realized this and, and, and so at the age of 17 uh, uh ursula young ursula giuliani enters the cloistered monastery of the poor clares and she takes the name sister veronica her her um, um uh, 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 name religious name now at the conclusion of the ceremony of her reception the bishop said to the abbess I commend this new daughter to your special care, for she will one day be a great saint. So obviously he'd seen something in her. And now Veronica proved her sanctity uh, right away by, what do we think? Right, her extraordinary visions, her extraordinary penances, her extraordinary, who knows? It was her extraordinary submission to the will of her superiors and spiritual directors. It was her obedience. That is how she proved her sanctity. Uh, because there, there's, with, with obedience to superiors, um, people think you have to trust them or believe them in order to obey them, and that's not true. And, and I would, I would, I mean, the, the sisters here know that very well. Obe obeying your superiors doesn't mean believing them. This is gonna be good for the community. Actually, I don't think so. The whole community is gonna suffer. But guess what? God knows best. And if God's will is that the whole community suffer, because of, you know, the superior's bad decision, that's what the person trusts in. And that's how saints throughout the ages have been able to obey even the worst of superiors because the, the, the church is full of them. We're living through it, right? And at some point, everybody's tempted to think, my superior's the worst. They, she doesn't know what she's doing, he doesn't know what he's doing, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, that's why obedience and trust are separate. Obedience and uh, agreement are separate. I obey the superior, but I trust God. Right? That is what we can always, always, always do. Uh, and that's what the saints did. It didn't matter what the superior said. They obeyed it, and they trusted in God. So that is how Veronica proved her sanctity. And uh, she, she wrote a diary throughout her religious life, which was for the next 40-some uh, years. And she wrote a 22,000-page diary. And in the first years of the monastery, she worked for 17 years. She joined when she was 17, and she spent 17 years... Um, just as a regular nun, working in the infirmary, the kitchen, the sacristy, uh, and she eventually became a novice mistress and, and later an abbess, and she did this very well. She learned from her two harsh methods as a young girl. She uh, would not allow novices to read mystical books, filling their head with, with dreams of this great sanctity. She had them read basic catechism learn your faith, right? Don't, don't, don't get all uh, dreamy-eyed about, about um, the mystical experiences, you know, the basics. Uh, as an abbess, she was very orderly, very disciplined, uh, but she also understood grace built on nature. So she enlarged the convent, made it more spacious and more comfortable for the nuns. They could, they could focus more. And she had running water piped into the, the convent. This is going to be in the 1700s. So this is, this is the proof, this is how the saints are. They have these great mystical experiences, but they're also very practical. This is not somebody whose who's, uh, head is lost in the clouds or who is, is just, it's all, um, you know, some people are, are like that by nature. They're having these mystical experiences and like they're borderline autistic, right? That's the problem. It's, you just can't, you can't see reality. The saints combine both of them. Uh, the mystical experience, which uh, Veronica had, uh, was in 1694, uh, the Saturday before Palm Sunday. Uh, Christ appeared to her with a crown of thorns on his head, and she wrote in her diary, I understood his infinite love and felt my own ingratitude. My Lord, she said, grant me this crown so that the punctures of its thorns may become voices enabling me to tell you how much I want to love you. And Christ took his crown of thorns and placed it on her head, and she felt her heart pierced at that moment. Uh, she would live for 33 years after that moment of being, her heart being pierced for Christ. And notice what she said. I, I want these punctures to be voices enabling me to tell you how much I want to love you. Not how much I do love you, how much I want to. And that's very consistent with what the saints say. We, we, uh, loving Christ is a gift. We have to ask for it. Uh, she received the stigmata 
on Good Friday of April 1697. So three years after the, um, the Crown of Thorns vision, she has uh, the stigmata received in 1697. And Christ tells her, prepare yourself for great suffering. And she did experience these great interior trials of soul. Uh, she constantly united her little acts of daily suffering to this. And she offered them for the missions, for those missionaries who are going out evangelizing uh, the Indians in, in the New World or the, those in the East. Um, um, uh, she, Christ died for all men, and she wanted to bring souls to Christ. She didn't care what souls. The, the, the missionaries never did. The victim souls never cared, uh, you know, who is the soul you bring to Christ? Anybody. Indian, uh, uh, you know, like racism never even enters into the discussion, right, with a true soul that loves Christ. Um, very, uh, we could say, relevant for our, our these times indeed. She would say um, of suffering, if the cross is the key to love, I want more and more of it. Suffering is my refuge, my relief, my help, my delight, my relief during the pains of love. And I live dying so as not to die of love. Uh, this would uh, be proved um, rather strikingly with a, a miracle after her death. Um, so prior to it, um, Christ showed St. Veronica his heart, and this is in a vision, and in this vision, engraven on Christ's heart were the golden letters, Veronica of Jesus and Mary, which was her religious name. And St. Veronica later told one of her close uh, friends that the symbols of Christ's passion and certain letters representing vows she had taken were engraven on her own heart. And this was thought to mean uh, mystically, but on the day of her death in uh, 1727, uh, they did an autopsy and the physician and the surgeons were astounded because on her right ventricle were engraven a cross, uh, flames, and the letters C, O, F, P, and U, which stood for uh, charity, obedience, fidelity, patience, and humility. Uh, astounding, like that doesn't, you, you, that can't happen, right? Uh, so um, th this this is this is just the brief you know, wave tops of of, of Saint Veronica Giuliani, and and this is this is not a, a very well known saint. Uh, the, the sisters here have a special devotion to her. Uh, we're happy to celebrate that feast today, uh, but this is just one of the many uh, uh, treasures in the church. You, you go walking through the church's basement and you trip over a, a box and there's this, this saint there. That's how it works. This is what we, what we mean when we say the riches of the church, the, 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 the depth, the, the, the vastness. This is our faith. This is our past. And, and, and these miracles happen. And there's so much disbelief these days in miracles. Uh, there's so much faithlessness because there's just so much distrust of the past. You know, I would say if, if our faith, if we don't have miracles in our faith, that should make us suspicious. Because our faith is founded on a miracle. It's founded on a man rising from the dead. It's founded on God speaking to us from heaven. Uh, so we should expect all these miracles to, to exist in our past and, and, and in the church. And, and to disbelieve that or, or to throw it away or to just say, oh, we've moved beyond. We're, we're different now. Uh, we're walking away from our own identity. And um, uh, I, you know, I, maybe I sound like a broken record, but we are going to see a return to the traditions of the church. Uh, I mentioned it just earlier this week, and that, that, that radical departure happened um, with, with that um, uh, attempt at Vatican II to, to derail the church. So Satan is always trying to derail the church, and he got really close uh, in recent times. But we are going to return. We're going to return to our proper Catholic identity, the proper Catholic uh, uh, culture, and that is what is going to be uh, saving the world in these uh, days to come. So let us ask uh, St. Veronica uh, for help in uh, uh, doing our part to make that happen. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.